And if you just want to click continue to stay, that's great. We are going to be going live to Facebook in just a moment. Oh, and for going live to Facebook, I'll put my screen up so people know where they are. Oh, Wes, before I do that, did you get a chance to spotlight Taryn or do I need to stop sharing? I can do it from here. Uh, spotlight Taryn, there you go. And hi, I know some folks are watching. They've joined us already as panelists. If you could put in the chat that you are seeing um, our ASL interpreter, just just to give us a little confidence that it's working. That would be great. Yes, thank you. And can I confirm uh, your view? Are you seeing my screen? I feel like I've lost my share screen. Yeah, you've lost your share screen at the I moment. I thought so. Thank you. Let me try to get that back. There, it's back. And I think we're live on Facebook. Hi, welcome <laughs> Facebook as well. <laughs> Sorry, you you saw the messiness of us getting ready there. Um, Welcome as we're getting ready and people are still joining us um, to let you know if you've joined us on Zoom, we are using the webinar format. So that means your cameras and microphones are not activated, but um, you can use the chat and the Q&A to share your questions and comments throughout the evening. If you're joining us on Facebook, my colleague Wes is uh, monitoring the chat there. And if you want to type your questions into the Facebook chat, if you're watching this live, he will pass those over to us so we can help try to address them. Uh, to get you started, and so we can hear a little bit from you, we have popped up a question for you. Uh, we're asking, why have you joined this evening's panel? What are you hoping to learn? Give people a moment to type it that in there. Heather has, uh, thanks Heather. Heather has typed in, um, she's joined this evening to learn what we might be missing when we're working in the sector. So uh, tonight's focus, we are thinking about those galleries, libraries, uh, art galleries and museums. Sarah, Sarah says that our museum is getting a brand new building and I want to try to avoid the mistakes of the past. Well, congratulations on a new building, Sarah. That's awesome. Jude is an amateur curator, just finishing a degree at UVic and wants to learn more about accessibility for future workplaces. Anna is an occupational therapist and is interested in access to community participation. Anya saw a recent social media posts highlighting accessibility features of our ORCA exhibit and wanted to know more. I wonder if those social media posts were Tara Moss is doing. Uh, Tara Moss has uh, been an influencer uh, posting about our ORCA exhibit. Jen uh, said they're looking for new ways for our programs to be more accessible at the Vancouver Public Library. Welcome Vancouver Public Library. And Anya said, yes, Tara, those were your posts she was following. Or they were following. <laughs> Great, thank you everyone. That's nice to know uh, a little bit more about who's in the audience and why you've joined this evening. And we'll start officially. I believe we are ready to get going. Let me get to my title screen again. <laughs> so good evening and welcome to our virtual panel, Accessibility in the Glam Sector. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the Royal BC Museum and my home are located on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen, the Songhees and the Squamalt Nations. I personally want to extend my appreciation for the opportunity to live and learn on this territory. 
I also want to acknowledge that this has been a difficult time with the news of the discovery of the mass grave of 215 children at the Kamloops Indian Residential School. Mm. Our hearts go out especially to Indigenous communities across BC and especially to residential school survivors and their families. I have a, a definition I thought I'd put up here just before we get started to make sure we all have a similar understanding uh, and it's posted up here for you. Um, the term where some terms I'm sure we'll hear more about accessible, accessibly, inclusive design, universal design. So we're re that's relating to that which can be reached, used, entered, obtained, attained, seen, or heard. And in terms of language relating to disability, these are broad terms. And then there's some examples given I'll in just a few washrooms with large stalls, accessible parking, captioned videos. And the focus is on accessibility as a solution and not disability as the problem. I also have a few agreements uh, to put up for our live participants tonight. The first is we ask that everyone checks their assumptions. This is, um, you know, to be aware of what you are thinking. Maybe ask yourself, oh, why do I have that picture come to mind? Or why am I making that assumption? Uh, so checking our own implicit bias. I want to say it's okay to be in the editing phase when communicating. I, I will be. I might be stumbling to look for the right word or term and language is changing. So uh, just to acknowledge that's okay if you, um, if you use the wrong term and we'll do our best to gently learn and correct each other. Try to acknowledge if you're feeling uncomfortable. Think about why that might be. And most of all, be aware of your intention versus the impact. So maybe your intention is to find out more, but the impact or the way a question is asked might be harmful. So to, to try to be aware of those things as we proceed. We will now go to our gallery view. So you could meet all the panelists who are here this evening with me. My name is Kim Goff and I'm a learning program developer at the Royal BC Museum and I use she, her pronouns. I'm a middle-aged white woman with medium length brown hair. I have dark round glasses on. I'm wearing a coral colored shirt and my background is a photograph of the outside of the Royal BC Museum. For this evening, our motive was National Accessibility Week which is May 30th to June 5th. It's an opportunity to celebrate the valuable contributions of Canadians with disabilities and to recognize the efforts of individuals, communities and workplaces that are actively working to remove barriers to accessibility and inclusion. For night, tonight's discussion, we have a panel of three people who through their lived experiences, advocacy and work all contribute to making BC a more accessible place for everyone. And I want to acknowledge that tonight is part of an ongoing process for myself. And it certainly isn't being proposed as a model for how to host a completely accessible virtual event. I appreciate your patience and understanding and hope that we can all learn together. So I'd like to have each of tonight's panelists introduce themselves and let's begin with Tara. Thank you, Kim. Uh, first of all, I want to say that it's such a pleasure to be participating tonight in this event. Um, so thank you for including me. Um, my name is Tara Moss. I am a middle-aged Caucasian woman with long uh, salt and pepper hair, big hair. Um, I'll say it is as well. I'm wearing a red dress with a pendant and uh, red lipstick, and I have tattoos that you can see. Uh, behind me is a golden uh, sort of um, natural scene on a divider and you can see some orchids and one of my books that's called The War Widow. Hope that you can visualize me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Taylor. My name is Kaylee Swan and I am the program coordinator for employment services with Community Living Victoria. I am a middle-aged white woman with rosy cheeks and I am currently wearing a floral blouse. My mother 
lovely of her to gift it to me. And in my background today, I have a blurred vision of our music studio in my home on the Souk Basin. And it is such a privilege to be invited to share uh, my vast experience in supported employment position. And it has been um, a dream of mine to be able to sit on a panel like this. So thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure. Taylor. Thanks, Kim. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Taylor. I use the pronouns she and her. Um, I am a Caucasian female in my late 20s. I'm wearing red headphones. I have long brown hair that's done up in a half bun. Um, I'm wearing a black shirt with a little can logo and my background um, is white behind me. So I am the training coordinator at Canucks Autism Network and I organize over 200 trainings a year with first responders, museums, schools, and sport and rec providers. Um, and I also work with many of these different organizations to create accessibility resources and sensory friendly spaces. Um, and uh, the Royal BC Museum holds a dear place in my heart. That was where I volunteered when I went to UVic. So I'm very happy to be here. Oh, that's sweet. I didn't know you had been a museum volunteer. <laughs> Well, again, thank you all for being at part of this evening. In 2018, BC declared its first Accessibility Week, citing that approximately 15% of BC's population self-identifies as having a disability, and that population is expected to grow to one in five by 2036. So let's start with something that's maybe a little bit obvious, but why is it important to discuss and promote inclusion and accessibility for people with disabilities? Tara, can we start with you? Sure. Um, what I could have also mentioned in my introduction is that I'm a disabled woman. So I'm one of those Canadians. Um, you can't see it right now through the computer, but I'm uh, sitting in my wheelchair, Hira. And so that the experience of becoming a wheelchair user and also someone with chronic illness, I've been diagnosed with CRPS, has been really eye opening for me to understand more of the challenges experienced by people with disability or chronic illness and people specifically that use mobility devices and find um, they need mobility uh, accessibility in their surroundings. We need to talk about this because so many different uh, public spaces and areas in our communities are still not accessible in that physical way. And I can speak to that from a, a personal level. I personally love the BC Museum because I've been coming there since I was a kid. And during this period for me, especially during COVID, it's become an oasis because it's fully accessible for people with my particular set of needs and my particular condition. It's somewhere I can come with my child and feel safe. And I know that as someone who's a mobility aid user, um, I'm not being excluded and I've actually been welcomed in a, really, uh, in a really clear way. And I think that a lot of people who are not disabled themselves or aren't, uh, experts in the area of accessibility, haven't studied accessibility and design, may not see just how important that is. But looking at the statistics, I think in 2017, Statistics Canada said that one in 10 adult Canadians had a mobility related disability. So that's one in 10 people in our communities if you're going to exclude them, it is, you know, limiting their participation in life and also their families and their friends participation because, you know, once you're using a wheelchair or other mobility device or even using a pram or you need access, that's a little different than a, a single uh, walking person. You're going to have to choose the environment you go into and so will everyone else who's with you. So this is a really quite a big topic that impacts a lot of people. And I think um, it's something that needs to be discussed because it would seem it doesn't sort itself out as intuitively. We need to hear from more disabled people 
and more people who are experts in this area so that we can make the world accessible. Yes, please. <laughs> Kaylee, uh, what about for you and uh, the community that you serve? So I, I really look through accessibility and inclusion through a lens of employment. Um, I guess our, you know, our communities and our culture is enriched by diversity. And I think what we're really lacking is the visibility of um, employment in terms of persons with disabilities. So the statistics, um, you know, tell us that less than 25% of people with disabilities in Canada are employed. And the remarkable um, difference that we see in terms of the um, ability for someone to engage in their communities, engage um, with their neurotypical peers or with their peers um, in situations where I guess I would say someone who is considered abled is uh, taken for granted. I think that um, the barriers that are presented in terms of accessing employment and um, identifying, you know, gifts and strengths and abilities is, um, is we need to be breaking that down and we need to break down break that down at a, at a greater rate. Um, when I think about uh, the Royal BC Museum, I am so proud of the fellow who uh, just recently retired from his position with the museum. And this fellow worked for the museum for over 30 years. Just an incredible pioneer for inclusive employment and a um, just a standout individual who has been so greatly supported by an incredible employer such as the Royal BC Museum has really paved the way for opportunities in many different places and I hope to grow that and see you know other successes come through as a result. Can you say a little bit Kaylee about the benefits of that program uh, for, for people like the fellow you were mentioning, but also what do you hear back from the employers? So we are so incredibly lucky to have been on the forefront of inclusive employment. Our program was originally funded through the United Way prior to receiving a permanent funding with Community Living British, British Columbia. And as a result of our deep roots that we have grown within the community, uh, we have been so fortunate to be able to not only go out and meet incredible employers and grow partnerships, but be there to walk alongside not only the person we are supporting to see their successes and, and just all, all of those wonderful, incredible results. So, you know, financial independence, um, community, belonging, um, a sense of self-worth and value, things that, you know, when you or I may perhaps take for granted because we're afforded such privilege that uh, when we get to partner with these job seekers and then find those just incredible champions who are out there and who in terms of employers who are looking to forge the way and be true leaders. And, you know, I think of some of the key employers like Thrifty Foods, for example, where people with disabilities work and they are visible. They are included the same as every single other employee and they are, have expectations to meet in the same way. So, you know, I would say that the feedback that I get from the employers are uh, consistently across the board is, you know, why didn't we do this sooner? Thank you. Taylor, the question was about, um, <laughs> to refresh you, <laughs> why is it important to discuss and promote inclusion and accessibility? And in your case, it's for people with autism. Yeah. I think, um, you know, what we were talking about, about the, the rates of disability um, is really important, but also a lot of the times when you make one thing more accessible for a certain group, it actually makes it more accessible for other people as well. Um, so an example of this is uh, for a lot of autistic people, um, having a social storybook, which is something that, you know, a museum can have on their website that lets people know what to expect when they arrive, like where do they park, 
Where do they go to get their ticket? What, what should they expect to see? Uh, that's really beneficial, uh, you know, for someone on the spectrum, but it could be really also helpful for somebody who has anxiety and wants to know what to expect. And so, you know, when you're trying to be accessible for one group, it could help another group as well. Um, and I just talking about that prevalence, I actually just got the brand new stat hot off the press today that um, one in 37 children in BC are diagnosed with autism. And so that, that means that, you know, it's like almost one kid in every single classroom. So the chances that you are going to meet somebody on the spectrum um, is huge. And the other thing is too, is that yes, sometimes there are these kind of mass uh, changes that we need to make to, to buildings to make them physically accessible. But there's a lot of very simple, easy things that you can do as well, that accessibility is not just physical. Um, there's that intellectual side too. And, and the changes like, you know, um, you know, giving somebody time to process, those are really quick, easy changes that you can implement right away. Mm, so true. We were actually working with Tenex Autism Network to have a, a um, autism friendly event at the Royal BC Museum and IMAX Theater. Can you describe a little bit about what some of those um, steps are or what some um, basic things that institutions have done to be to host events like that? Yeah, well, I think the one that I mentioned, the social storybook is a huge one. And we've been collaborating with Royal BC Museum um, making that. And it was really interesting timing that we were working on that kind of before and just at the beginning of COVID because really, I think everybody really wants to know what to expect when they go into a new place during COVID. Uh, so that was really good timing. Um, we also talked about, uh, you know, giving people directions or pieces of information or instructions. Sometimes when you walk into a museum, it's like, okay, you have this gallery down here, you have this gallery upstairs, you can go watch an IMAX movie. And that's quite a bit of information. Um, and so, you know, just kind of keeping those points simple, but then, you know, offering a map and showing just where to find more information about those things when they arrive. Um, that's just something simple that you can do that's really accessible. Um, and the last one I'll quickly say is just, uh, you know, having a space where somebody can decompress um, because sometimes we have uh, there's there's families that go out into the community and and they're scared to do so because maybe their child or their youth or their adult um, you know maybe it's too loud for them maybe it's a really bright space and that can be a really overwhelming experience so having somewhere kind of quiet uh, I mean, a library is a bad example. There's lots of quiet spaces in a library, but um, you know, maybe in a museum is a is a, a great, um, really accessible thing that you can do. Mm -hmm. I'd love to just speak very quickly to what Taylor mentions there about the fact that there's a lot of crossover in terms of different groups and their needs. So, if you're someone who has chronic pain, for example, you want to be able to have a bit of time out. Um, if you're someone with a physical disability that requires, say, a wheelchair or a walker like myself, again, you're going to want to have a pretty good idea of what you're going to encounter so that you don't get actually stuck. You know, you come around a corner and find staircases and realize you can't actually get to where you want to go. So often having those um, signs showing, directing you on where to go and a website that makes that really clear just puts you at ease so you're willing to leave the house and have these experiences. And unfortunately, when you don't have that accessibility normalized, and I think we still have a long way to go in 2021 to normalizing that, you'll find, for example, that I can look online and find out if I can bring my pet to a restaurant, but not my wheelchair, or you know, I will not really be sure what I'm going to encounter, even going to say a doctor's office, they might have a staircase or something. And that unpredictability um, can make it feel hard to navigate the world with independence. And we want everyone to feel that, you know, that confidence, leaving the house, participating fully, uh, regardless of what kind of group or category they're in. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I'm so glad you emphasize that because I really believe universal design is good design for everybody. So there is um, benefits for all areas uh, of the community when something is made more accessible. And there's a question here in the chat uh, from Raven who's asking, what are you doing to improve wheelchair access? I think that's probably directed at us at the Royal BC Museum as our museum was built in um, late 60s and early 70s. And that wasn't part of the design of this building. There are mezzanine levels. Um, there are uh, uneven floors. There are um, difficult narrow spaces to and very dark spaces to navigate. So we totally get that, uh, that question. And there have been some retrofits that have happened, but retrofitting is, is not always ideal either. So <laughs> I think as well as if you have something like that storybook that you can share, um, here's some challenges that you might have or some, um, some ways around, how else can you see this exhibit if you can't physically get to it? Now, since uh, I know a lot of the people who've joined us live this evening are working in the glam sector, um, what, are, what is some advice that you have for businesses like ours, like the Royal BC Museum, and what we can do to be more accessible? So in addition to the storybook idea. Kaylee, I'm going to go to you. <laughs> I guess I immediately think of a, a recent experience uh, where I am currently um, consulting and working with a very large corporation in terms of accessibility and uh, through that employment lens. Um, granted, I probably will speak to that a lot today, just that's that's my bread and butter and my passion. Uh, but I think of the consultation that I have, I, my dog is whining and I'm sorry, <laughs> that uh, in terms of even as simple as the, you know, interview process. So uh, I was, I contacted by this company and they reached out directly to us as an organization due to our again those deep roots in our community to consult on how they could be more inclusive in terms of their hiring and to sit in through that process and and essentially become you know somebody uh, for lack of a better term a guinea pig to go through what their existing process looks like and to be able to break down those barriers you know putting barriers where they don't belong just doesn't make sense in any in any way so I think of the the questions that are asked in an interview process you know those broad um, tell me about a time when well you know that's that can be a really challenging thing to approach when you think in a black and white way. So, you know, in terms of reviewing someone's resume and reading about their experience and asking them specific questions about, you know, situations that they may have encountered in that and the interview process of providing those questions ahead of time so that somebody who needs that time to process and to prepare their answers are going to come in feeling confident rather than anxious and lost and to go through, you know, working interviews and um, just where you know, we can break down those unnecessary mountains that we put forward with our perception that, you know, well, no, if you can't answer this question, then we're not going to consider you for employment. And you lose out on such an incredible, incredible employee the uh you know I, we work with people whose employers have gone through more of that you know individualized and unique approach and who are get sent home when they're sick because they still come in every day because they love their job and they are so committed and you know the retention rate is such so incredible i just it, there's just so many things that we can do to reframe our thinking around those types of approaches. Uh, can I just mention that I, I think um, everyone, I mean, it's clear that everyone's experience of the world is a little bit different and everyone's needs and access needs are different, whether they identify as disabled or autistic or in another um, identifiable group, um, everyone has access needs. So um, that's one of the reasons I don't personally like euphemisms like special needs, because there's nothing special about needing to get somewhere and participate in life. We all have that need. It's just that um, some of the accommodations might be a, a little bit different. And in my personal experience, and I think this speaks to how 
inaccessible, unfortunately, other parts of Victoria can be. When I go to the BC Museum, I do feel included and I do feel um, that it's accessible. It might not be for another person, but I find that as a wheelchair user, for example, um, there's those special touches that make me feel included. Like I've been coming to the BC Museum since I was my daughter's age, and it wasn't until I was using a wheelchair that I realized in the natural history area next to the sort of sea anemones and the, 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 the little pond, there's an area that's perfectly wheelchair sized. So you can wheel in and you can be really close to the exhibit and see everything. So you're not missing out. It's touches like that you might not realize until you're in that position that just make you feel like welcome. You're not excluded naturally by the design. So I, I'm sure the BC Museum agrees and Kim, you've spoken to this that you want to improve things. But I, I have to say that um, it's been like an oasis for me. And I really appreciate the fact that you're taking this, you know, you're know, you on the front foot really wanting to get this right. And with the Orcas um, exhibition, for example, having Braille, having, um, you know, different uh, sound and visual options so that, and room so that people can maneuver through the exhibit I love that you have that. That is what you're aiming for. And I would love to see that be the norm. I, oh, sorry, I can. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, thank you, Tara, so much for saying that. It is so true that, you know, everybody has their unique individual needs. And I think a piece of this is just being as humble and judge um, non-judgmental um, as you can and that you never know a person's situation there could be a kid screaming and crying and you could think oh they're just that kid is just not getting what they want but you know it could be a sensory meltdown you have absolutely no idea and I know that I've mentioned kind of a sensory friendly quiet space but I know when we're talking about archives and museums and libraries, that these are quieter spaces. But on the flip side of that, I think, uh, like, say you're going to an IMAX film. Um, you want it to be really nice and quiet so that you can listen to the film. But that's not going to be accessible for everyone. Um, there's some people with disabilities that may get really excited when they see something awesome on the screen and they want to squeal and they want to get really excited about it. And the hardest part um, of this is that there's gonna be a lot of people who are judgmental in the audience that are gonna look at them and, and be angry about it. And so I think that that non-judgmental attitude piece is so important. Um, and so, you know, for right now, maybe in those museums and galleries, uh, you might not have a quiet space. You might have a space that someone can go and have those reactions when maybe they're reading a book in the library. Uh, but, you know, in hopes, we want to make this a more normalized thing and get people used to that. It's okay if somebody is, is stimming and walking back and forth and flapping their arms in public. Um, that's just how they are, um, you know, decompressing. Maybe they're really excited about something. Maybe they're stressed about something. Yes, thanks for that. And I mean, part of that is uh, changing our culture, really, um, and not just our legislation. What, what kind of tips do you share for, for people who are trying to change their culture? I would love to speak to that if, if it's okay. Um, I'm primarily a novelist in, as an occupation. I do a lot of disability advocacy, but it's, it's, um, it's not my work, it's, it's my passion. And uh, within the area of um, fictional narratives, we have let disability communities down and people with difference, whether it's uh, physical difference, mental difference, or even cultural difference, we've tended to let them down a lot in our mainstream culture and cultural narratives. So I'm passionate about representing communities as closer to the way they exist. So um, there's going to be people with disabilities in my novels because they exist in our communities. There's gonna be people of different racial, racial and cultural backgrounds and different genders in my books because that's what exists in the world. And it also makes storytelling 
so much better and less predictable. Um, so we have seen that kind of very narrow idea of what the world looks like. It doesn't reflect reality. And of course, um, it doesn't really help people to understand each other very well. Um, I think novels are great empathy machines. It helps you to understand what different lives are like. So if we're constantly excluding certain types of lives, they, they continue to be othered in, in our uh, cultural memories and in our minds. So uh, as a novelist, that's what I try to do to change culture. And also as a disabled woman, as someone who identifies as disabled, I try to be very visible um, in online spaces as a way to shift that representation a little bit, be one of those many millions of people who are visible um, so that we can see that there are people with difference. Um, so from a cultural perspective, I think that there's a lot that needs to be changed and we have to come at it from so many different angles and with so many viewpoints and perspectives. Visibility is so important and I would love to be part of that book club. So let's, let's get some book suggestions out there and see if we can get to read more. Kaylee, were you going to add to that? Well, you know, I come from a bit of a unique background myself in the sense that I have had the most incredible upbringing um, around my family. We have a very um, awesome, very different, you know, eight siblings on one side and four on the other. Um, but I, my uncle uh, was born with Down syndrome and his name was Phil. And in a family of the ninth of, of nine children and, and he, his experience growing up born in 1964 has been so incredibly different than many people who have kind of walked that same journey. So he lived in his own suite in an apartment building uh, with another brother in the same building and, you know, had his own life, made his own choices and was incredibly independent um, throughout that time. And at, you know, 1964 through to 2020, 2020, um, just to be able to um, be an advocate to see that for other people. I guess in terms of the, that culture change, I think too, we have the awesome, awesomest opportunity to partner on a, um, a youth employment project. So we are part of the impact project, which has been uh, funded through a um, research grant with the Ministry of Social Development and Poverty Reduction. And I'm working with youth who are 15 to 19 because we know if we are able to connect with these youth at those young ages, that we're going to see such incredible outcomes and transition success for them as they move into adulthood. And I, I think back to the meetings that I've had with those youth and their families and their parents and caregivers and guardians who say, you know, it's one day, Kaylee, that I wish that I dream that my youth or my child will, will work. And I, I have to counter that with, you know, that's my expectation. I expect that as an opportunity. I expect your child to work because we're all citizens in the same community. We all have to contribute. Not only do we have rights, we have responsibilities. And it, it really boils down to those, those opportunities and unique gifts and pulling out those, those, you know, strengths and just those dreams. You know, these youth have had the same expectations of their lives. They have grown up, they've been included in their schools, they have dreams of, you know, marriage and children and living in their own apartment and all of, all of those same things that all of their neurotypical peers do. And, you know, that's, that's where my responsibility comes in, I feel, is that in terms of, you know, could that culture change, that expectation that us as a community will support everyone to meet those same goals. Thank you. And uh, I'm looking, there's um, questions starting to come in now, but uh, Karen is asking in the chat, uh, she says, can someone please talk about the needs of people with serious mental health challenges regarding employment and volunteering? And Kaylee, you, you've touched on that a little bit. Can you add anything else to that that might, um, might address what Karen is asking? You know, I feel that that stigma that is in our, currently in our culture around that need to hide um, those challenges that every single one of us experience and how much more under the microscope it's been given this pandemic. And I, I, you know, that we need to have these, this needs to be the norm in terms of communication and, and conversations in employment. Um, the, 
it's just been hidden for far too long. And there are resources out there. And I think to, you know, my own self and my need for consistent mental health help and support through counseling from when I was, you know, knee high to a grasshopper and throughout my entire life. I think that um, to be able to reach out and, and say, I need help, but also not have to face that stigma of why with partnerships through the CMHA, the Canadian Mental Health Association and their employment programs, we've set, seen such growth and opportunity and real support that is out there. So there are programs that are available. There is additional supports, but we need to break down that stigma. Mm -hmm. There is uh, some questions here in the q and I'm looking at a question from Jen, who says, curious about virtual programs. If you have limited funds, what are the most important things you can do to make your Zoom programs accessible? Is it an interpreter? Is it paying for captions? Is it making it available afterwards? Any advice there? Taylor, I see you're nodding. Maybe you have some uh, experience with that. Yeah, we actually run uh, virtual programs with Canucks Autism Network for our youth, our um, adults, our kids, everybody. And um, one of the things that's worked really well for us um, is that we kind of send out a questionnaire beforehand. And it's just as simple as, are there any accommodations that you need um, when it comes to a virtual program? Because you don't want to get an ASL interpreter if no one needs an ASL interpreter and be paying for that, right? Um, and so... Um, yeah, I find that that works really well for all events because then you can anticipate uh, the needs of the people who are attending. Um, but I would definitely say um, from, from what I've learned, uh, I'm not an ASL expert, um, but I think an ASL interpreter um, is better sometimes than captions just because the syntax in ASL uh, is a little bit different um, than the English spoken language. Mm -hmm. I think Taryn agrees with you. Yeah. <laughs> Outside of um, events that are online, um, just thinking about the way you handle your online presence in social media can be very important. Um, making sure that you've got alt descriptions, um, making sure that you've got captions on your videos. These are really easy things to do. They don't take very long and there's great apps for them now. So whether you're a citizen or an institution, um, those are a couple of really easy things you can do to make your social media just that little bit more accessible. That's something I've been noticing more on Instagram uh, are descriptions about the photographs. I've seen that happening more and more. So there's that, again, that idea of making that just uh, more of a typical process. I just wanted to chime in a bit about that, um, maybe a bit of a silver lining, I suppose, around the, the pandemic and, and what we are seeing as a result of, of different ways of doing things. So we've seen such significant gaps in digital literacy. And um, I'm currently involved in a, a pilot project with the Canadian Association of Supported Employment to develop a digital literacy certificate program that is accessible to everyone. And you know, perhaps that might even be something to consider. Um, in, you know, launching these virtual platforms and, and, you know, just an idea. I like it. Yes, please. There's a, another question here from Jade on a similar vein, asking about extending accessibility to online exhibits and museums. Um, what should one consider in regards to accessibility solutions for those who are not geographically able to access the physical museum or maybe have limited internet access? Uh, maybe it's slow or maybe they have to use the library and that type of thing. That's to... such a good point. Sorry, Sorry. Tara. No, please. <laughs> this is the beauty of Zoom, hey? Where we just interrupt each other all the time. <laughs> um, that is, yeah, that's such a good point. And, and what I absolutely love about this digital world is that, you know, people who are still quite fearful of COVID or, um, you know, are nervous about coming to that space still get to access it. And I think for um, 
like the kind of autism experience, um, one of the big things I've noticed that, um, you know, in, in person, um, we always kind of say you should give uh, somebody, you know, five to 10 seconds to process your instructions before you repeat it. Because sometimes if you repeat it again, that it takes that person that much longer to receive the information and process it again. And in the digital world, it is so difficult. Um, if you're running a program online, you might ask your audience a question and, you know, it's really awkward to pause uh, digitally and have nobody talking, um, but you do need to allow that, we call it the awkward teacher pause, because not only do people have to think and process the question you're asking, but they have to unmute themselves or they have to uh, type in the chat box. Uh, so that's just one kind of simple thing that I've really noticed has helped on digital platforms of creating that more kind of welcoming space is allowing that time. 16 seconds, Heather, yes. 16 seconds just sounds short, but it is so long, yes. <laughs> I really hope that when um, things shift with COVID that we keep a lot of these online programs because it is really accessible for people who are either housebound um, and, and there's a remarkable number of us. If, if I don't have someone help me get the wheelchair of the house, I can't leave the house. So um, I actually love to be able to do things online. Um, and as someone with chronic pain, same thing. You might be low on spoons as they call it that day. Um, spoon theory being uh, Christine Miserando's um, idea about someone with chronic illness having a certain number of spoons each day and you use a spoon to do each thing. So things like telehealth or things like online um, exhibits, having that access come right into your comfortable space can be really a, a positive thing. And I hope we don't get rid of that completely as things begin to shift. I hope that we keep that level of accessibility uh, normal in our lives and also that workplace flexibility because not everyone has the ability to come to work all the time when they want to, but they might be able to be just as productive from home potentially. Um, so hopefully we've normalized that and we can hang on to that silver lining from this difficult time. Yes, I, I was trying to wait 16 seconds, but it was very hard. <laughs> um, I agree that the um, silver lining for for us personally in our program department has been making more things available online. But in terms of making them accessible, I'm not sure um, we've been 100%, we haven't been 100% successful in that. Um, and that there is more that, that we could do. Um, just because it's available online doesn't automatically mean it's accessible. So um, I'm really appreciative of the the suggestions and comments and resources that are that are coming um, coming through tonight. So I that, thank you. Um, there's a comment or a question rather here from Jude who said, uh, in circumstances at the Royal BC Museum, such as Old Town, or some parts of the natural history exhibit that are have immersive flooring. So it, um, for people that can walk, what are some of the ways the museum may make these older areas more accessible? So. Um, Jude's referring to, if you haven't been here, in, we have an exhibit that feels like you're walking through an old town and the floor is made of these wooden bricks and they're spaced apart quite a bit. So it it's, feels rough. You definitely, I, know, I notice it under my feet that it has changed. Um, I have pushed a wheelchair in that area and a stroller in that area and it is rough and difficult and must be very uncomfortable for the person in the ride as well. Um, right now, those areas are not, we don't have anything physically done, um, but we did have a, a focus group here on site. And one of the suggestions um, that they came up with, so we invited them to identify some of the areas uh, and that were an issue, but also to help us think about how to solve them. And one of the solutions was laying down like a plexiglass strip 
um, that went on the side so that if you wanted and needed a smoother ride, you could still see the flooring. It wouldn't visually uh, affect the look, but it would provide a smoother surface to, to go on. So we shared those suggestions um, with our staff, but this was um, just prior to COVID. So. <laughs> Uh, that, that hasn't been implemented at this time, but it was one idea that would require some testing, I imagine. Uh, and that's actually something we've, we have done with our staff who join us um, in the summertime to help visitors. We call them visitor experience designers. And uh, on their first week of getting started, we invite them to visit the museum um, from different, without them knowing it very well. And uh, we typically have uh, one of them um, use a wheelchair and then go around the museum. So they get a more empathy for what that experience is like and they can help uh, redirect people um, or when they see them arrive, you know, give them a heads up or offer another alternative route or something that might be um, a, a better experience. So that, that's been a, uh, an eye-opening way for staff who um, may not have have those disabilities to get a little more empathy for what it's like, what it could be like. Yeah, the old town area is 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 rough. I I can personally navigate over it, but not um, necessarily the areas that have a sort of rock. You know, the mining, um, the gold mine area, and that that can be pretty rough on uh, even on the footplates of your wheelchair hitting as you as you go over the uneven areas. And it's a pretty wide space, so I'm interested in in what you. Um, decide to implement. Um, my first thought is that plexiglass mm -hmm. might be hard for people if they're using a walker um, in terms of it being slippery. Mm -hmm. but, um, obviously, it would all have to be trialed and tested. You automatically, um, you know, in terms of your story there about people coming through and to give you feedback, that just automatically makes me think that that's exactly what the museum needs is they need advocates, self-advocates. They need to be speaking to the people, the users of the museum and to be polling them specifically and to get that feedback. Uh, we can, you know, somebody who doesn't use a chair, I can, you know, throw out ideas, but I don't live that experience. That's, that's not my day to day. So it's so important. I think that, that you tap into that resource and that you receive that feedback. Mm -hmm. So important and being open to that. And in regards to that, we'll be capturing the chat. So any comments you've made here, uh, if it relates uh, particularly to the museum and our own accessibility, I will be sharing those. So thank you for putting them into the chat. Um, before I jump to my final question, uh, just in time, Jen has asked in the question and answer, she's thinking about creating a social story video about visiting a library at either a library program or a building that folks could watch ahead of time. What makes a good social story, Taylor? Oh, I love this. Great job. Kudos to you for creating that. Um, well, one of the things that, that I saw that was really cool, um, you don't necessarily have to do this. <laughs> this is kind of a little bit of a tangent, but I'm currently working with the Museum of North Vancouver and they are lucky that they are still in the kind of construction phase. They are opening soon, but they have a little bit of more flexibility with how they can kind of change their space. Um, but one of the things they're doing is they actually have somebody who is autistic, who is filming the video for them um, to introduce the space, which I thought was really cool. But um, just to kind of offer some, just straight to the point, some tips, um, some things I recommend you include are the expectations of, you know, how one should behave when they're at, when they're in your space, um, maybe some picture or some shots of the staff, what they look like, what their uniform looks like, that those are people that they can go to um, if they need any help. Uh, another great one is, you know, the areas that are maybe more loud or quieter or have bright lights. Uh, things like that, that you anticipate, you know, there might be some accessibility needs and just kind of going off that physical accessibility, um, you know, some areas that you might foresee, <laughs> maybe you have uh, the cobblestone rocky areas as well that you can just kind of front load people ahead of time. Um, and then, you know, how to enter the building, where to park, 
uh, those sorts of things. So yeah, just trying to think about one, the perspective of a person that, you know, might feel a little bit anxious, they want to know um, what to expect when they arrive. But then two, um, just thinking about that sensory piece of smells and lights and sounds. Mm, yeah, that's an important one as well. Um, just wondering, uh, Taylor, have you ever seen a storybook as or a story as a like a graphic novel treatment? Or have they been? I imagine they come in every format. Yeah, absolutely. And there were actually many really awesome ones that came out when COVID first started, um, just because there were you know a lot of um, individuals on the spectrum who you know, were maybe really frustrated or surprised that they weren't able to go to school or their programs. Um, and yeah, there's some amazing ones out there if you if you look for them. But um, yeah, Royal BC Museum, I think you, I know we worked on it, but I'm assuming you probably have it on your, your website now. Is that right, Kim? I don't believe it's on our website because okay. um, I don't believe it is. And I think uh, Alex has been working on that and is going to be redressing it. I think with yes. COVID and there were so many changes and unknowns and then closed, unfortunately, some things got put on, on still a pause. Yeah, no, that's fair. Yeah. Um, I'd say a really good one that we've helped work on is uh, Science World. They are wonderful leaders in accessibility. Um, so you can check that resource out online. And another really cool feature that they have is um, they have a map when you first walk into the building that shows um, those kind of sensory spots of places that are quieter, louder, um, you know, bright, smelly, all those kinds of things. So I thought that was a, a cool touch as well. When you say sensory spots, I think of things you can touch. And uh, Michael in the chat is just uh, gave an example of a museum in Lisbon, which has 3D display panels. So if it's talking about a tile pattern on the floor, they have a tile that you can touch and feel um, what's being described or talked about. Very neat. Yeah, that. that's so cool. I'd, I'd enjoy it. <laughs> I'd love to see that sensory map and one that has um, maybe directions for accessibility uh, that's physical as well. Um, you know, have, having a little map that tells you, you know, when you're going up through the First Nations area, for example, you're going to reach that area where there's stairs and you're going to turn around and go back and you're going to take that lift. You know, I've, I now know my way around, but when you're first using a mobility aid and you suddenly go, oh, that's right, there's stairs here, what do I do? You know, if you are someone who suffers with some anxiety or who's experiencing uh, other medical problems or chronic pain, it can feel a bit overwhelming. You think, I'm, you know, what am I gonna do? Um, so having a map is just really helpful, having clear directions and also maybe knowing that before you, you start to enter those spaces. So yeah, I really support um, the idea of having some clear maps that people can easily access and it just feels normal to, to get that um, heads up as to what you're going to be discovering when you uh, have a look at the museum and when you're actually physically inside it. And again, to that point of uh, universal design is good design. Um, many people could appreciate, use that and find value in it. Jade uh, it was commenting that um, a quiet space to decompress, uh, some exhibits are very emotional or trigger triggering and even neurotypical people such as, such as themselves may want a quiet corner to process their experience. Uh, in one gallery before going to a next. So we are getting close to the end of our time and I would want to give each of you a chance um, if you could impart one final message about accessibility for everyone listening, what would that message be? Um, all right, I'll jump in. Uh, well, obviously, I think if you're here, this is something that you're passionate about, and it's something that you realize is really important. And so I just want to say a huge kudos. And this is, you know, an amazing first step to realize that there are gaps. Um, and especially if you want your museum, your library to be successful, uh, this is a very, you know, sometimes untapped population and, and it will really, you know, it's, it's beneficial both ways. And 
Uh, I know it seems daunting and there's so many different needs that so many different people have, but just know that you do not have to do it all yourself. There are tons of um, you know, accessibility organizations that support different people with disabilities. And we would be happy to share our knowledge and support what you're doing because we think that it is so important. And so, yeah, huge thank you. And thank you so much for having me tonight. Tara, let's go to you. Oh, okay. Um, I, um, I, I want to end, I guess, on just reiterating how important accessibility is. And I guess when you're speaking um, as a member of the, the disability community, for example, there's very often this idea that it's, it's other and it's over there, but there are people with disabilities in all of our communities and it cuts across all groups. So, you know, in business, in your community and different social um, um, areas, we're everywhere and sometimes you might not see us because you might be somewhere that is inaccessible. You can get the idea that um, disabled people aren't out there, but we are. Um, and so this is just hugely important uh, for everyone, even if it's, if it's not for you now, it might be for someone you know, it might be a family member, or it might be for you in the future um, that these things are gonna become really important in your life. This discussion is enormously important and we need to normalize um, accessibility and normalize disability and normalize different uh, people who are not neurotypical or have different access needs, because that's what is represented in our communities. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I guess in terms of my final message, and I really want to build off what you've said there, Tara, in terms of uh, you never know what somebody is living. You never know what truth they're living. And that inevitably all of us will experience a form of disability at some point in our lives. And I think it's so important that um, people who work in this type of a field, such as mine, that we are constantly coming from a place of curiosity. And I'm looking for guidance. I never want to ever be considered an authority on this type of work um, that I'm always learning and growing and that those relationships that I build with each unique person only helps me be better in terms of, you know, just my humanity at the end of the day. And that's so important that we, we're, we're social creatures and we benefit so greatly from all of that <laughs> I wish it just wasn't diversity, but you know, it's, it's so important. Thank you all so much. I, I have to say, I'm thinking about um, assumptions a lot and trying to be more aware of when I'm making assumptions and to catch and to stop that and how important visibility is as well. And um, empathy, not sympathy, right? To to put yourself in that other situation and try to experience it from as many ways as you can. You have been wonderful panelists, just to echo the many comments uh, coming in. Thank you each so much for um, the work you do and your personal lives and your careers to um, increase accessibility. And it's been an absolute pleasure to have your perspectives and expertise this evening. I wanna also uh, thank my colleague, Wes uh, McInnes, who helped put tonight together along with our former colleague, Bronwyn Hudson, who has uh, moved on us. <laughs> so we're really thankful to Bronwyn as well for helping us uh, get this ready. And for everyone who's participated tonight, I know you're here because um, you're also making positive changes and um, or you have a point of view to share and, and we do want to hear it. As I said, we will be sharing the, uh, saving the chat so we can uh, share that. If you signed in and registered on Zoom, I have a little resource document I've been developing that I'll share with you uh, either uh, in the next couple of days um, and encourage you to uh, be in touch with us if you have 
questions, comments, um, and suggestions. We, we would like to hear from you. So with that, I say good night, uh, and I hope you all have a, a wonderful rest of the week and take care of yourselves. And I hope we, we see each other again. Bye-bye.